So I watched a, uh, uh, I, uh, I watched part of a video and then I read the rest. A guy was talking about ways you can make your sermon uh, interesting. And the first thing he said was, shorten it. <coughs> <laughs> so today I'm going to shorten it and uh, that's why I gave you the paper and that's why I'm going to put up everything all at once on the first page anyway and uh, so you can see it and you can begin to fill it in and and uh, and I wanted you to write it I understand that people learn from hearing some people learn from seeing and some people learn from writing it down and some of us need all three to help us so you can learn by uh, watching, listening, and writing, and, and then later you can repeat it to yourself. And uh, so we have a lot of ways of learning. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's the um, unwise pastor who thinks he preaches 52 sermons a year and everyone knows everything he preached about. Uh, I know that's not possible. There are times when I'm not sure what I preached about a couple of weeks ago. You know, it's just hard to remember all of that. But what you want to do when you come into a message, and especially like a message like today, is you just want the Lord to speak to you and to say something to you. And you look in here for God, speak to me. Maybe some of the points don't make any difference to you. Uh, and maybe they just say, oh, I know that. But what you really want God to do is just to speak to you. That takes concentration. It's hard to do other things. And uh, while, you know, while you're trying to hear from God, it's one of the reasons it's disruptive when people are talking and people are moving and, and looking in their phones and people, you know, I'm out here going, how many of you really are watching the verses on your phone, you know? <laughs> I don't know, I can't tell. It's when you smile and look at me, I think, that wasn't, uh, you know, why are you smiling? <laughs> you know, it, it's just distracting. And so what you want to do in a message is you want to say, all right, God, you have my full attention. What do you want to say to me today? And so you might say at the end, well, I learned a lot, but God didn't speak to me. Well, I would be surprised. Because God tends to speak all the time to us if we're just listening. Most of the time we're just not listening. So what, what you want to do is you want to focus your attention. It is so difficult to focus. You know, and so what you have to do is you have to put everything else away. You have to put the phones away. You have to put the, the books away. You got to put the thoughts away. You got to say, "All right, God, I'm not going to listen to the. Um, I'm not going to listen to my troubles from last week. I know my stomach is hurting right now. I know my head's aching right. Now. You know, there are all kinds of things. My toe is hurting right now. It it actually is hurting right now. And 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 so you, and if you're not careful, everything distracts you from hearing God. So you have to focus your attention. It is so difficult in the 21st century for people to focus. Everything is a half an hour or an hour. Everything is fast, 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 fast. We watch a three-hour movie. It must move or we don't focus. Right? You go to a movie that's three hours long now, and you think, why did, why did I sit there for three hours and get preached at? Because it moves so quickly and things were happening and you're worried about this and wondering about this and, and then you come and you hear from God's word and, and we're struggling to say, hey, God wants to say something to you today in his word. And it's so difficult. That's why the guy said, if you want to keep people's attention, one of the things you might consider is every once in a while preaching a short message. So turn with me now to the book of Ruth in the fourth chapter. You remember that Ruth uh, is a story really that gets us David. There are some that believe that that's the only reason for the whole book, that we know David's lineage. Without Ruth, we would not know that. And there are others that believe it's symbolic of lots of things. I think it's symbolic of a kinsman redeemer. And we have looked already at Naomi and she and Elimelech leaving Bethlehem area, going off to Moab in a place to run from God's judgment on Israel. They ran from judgment. And usually when you run from your discipline, you always run into a greater discipline, not a lesser one. When you run from God's discipline in your life, you'll always run to Moab, and there's more di discipline. So Elimelech and Naomi get into Moab, and his, their, their sons marry Moabites. They were not supposed to marry Moabites. 
but they did. And then the two boys, uh, then the, the father dies, Elimelech dies, then the two sons die, and that leaves Naomi with two daughters-in-law. And then she decides it's time to go back. Get back under God's provision. Get back under God's rule in her life. And she decides to go back to Bethlehem, and she tells them, go, and go back to your people and your gods. One of the daughters does. The other, Ruth, says, no, I want to go where you go. Where you go, I'll go. Your God will be my God. Your, everything about you is me. I'm going with you. And so Naomi brings her back, and when she comes back, they're without any way of supporting themselves. Women in that time had no way of supporting themselves. There had to be someone to take care of them. And so Ruth, being the, the uh, young and strong young lady, decides she will go out and glean and take some of the leftovers from the field and bring that home to, to, um, to Naomi, and they would eat. And she did that day after day after day after day with nothing no prospects of anything getting better. No job promotions ahead. No increase in pay. Just work. Just to survive. And then Boaz comes on the scene. Takes, an, takes a look. Decides to help her. And then Naomi says, he's a kinsman of ours. So why don't you go lay down at his feet. And when you lay down at his feet, you let him decide what he's going to do. She basically submitted herself to Boaz, laid there, and Boaz covered her over and promised her that he would take care of her. And then we come to this part in the story. He is not the kinsman closest another man is. And that man says, I'll redeem her. I mean, I'll redeem Naomi's things. And in, in the land was always important to the Jew. The land was everything. You know what? We put flowers on our graveside, remember? You know, don't we? You know, in Memorial Day, you'll go out to the graves and there'll be flowers everywhere. You know what they put on the graves in, in Israel? Rocks. So you go to a grave site in, in, in uh, one of the ones I went to in Jerusalem, just rocks on top of rocks. Just, and it's not, picture, it's, not, it's not flowers. It's the land. It's the rock that's on their, their, their uh, grave sites. And you just look at that and you just think, what is it about the land? Well, it was God's promise to Israel, the land. And the land was important. And everyone was given certain portions of land when they came into the promised land. They fought for that land. Some died for that land, but God had promised it. So they had the land. Mm -hmm. And when they have the land, they feel like they're where God wants them. It was the promised land. And God provided for a way that if you lost your land, you could redeem it on the 70 year of the year of Jubilee land returned back to the owners and in this case when a man dies the land to whom does it go well it goes to the one who's willing to redeem it to purchase it because the land is important and so the man who is closest to Naomi to Elimelech that one said, I'll buy the land. He wants the land. And then what's interesting is Boaz says, hey, by, by the way, when you, get, um, when you get the land, you also get the girl. And she's going to be your wife. And this guy's probably, it's really kind of funny because the Bible almost gives you an impression. He goes, whoa, whoa. I got all I can handle back at home. I don't need another one. And he said, I refuse. So he didn't have to redeem, but he was first in place. He gives his place away, and then Boaz steps up. And now look at verse 9 in chapter 4. Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, Today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilian, and Mah Mah Malan. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabitess. Mullen's widow as my wife in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from the town records. Today you are witnesses. Then the elders and all those at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah who together built up the house of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. 
through the offspring of the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. Then he went to her, and the Lord en enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child, laid him in her lap, and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. This then is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron the father of Ram. Ram the father of Aminadah. Aminadah the father of Nashon. Nashon the father of Salmon. Salmon the father of Boaz. Boaz the father of Obed. Obed the father of Jesse. And Jesse the father of David. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord, in here, you are our kinsman redeemer. You have purchased us. Now, Lord, may we be encouraged today of how you see us and the way you see us. As Boaz looked at Ruth, you look at us. Now, Lord, burn that into our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. You have value. It's not because you know so much. It's not because you look so good. It's not because you have things. It's not because you're talented. It's not because you're handsome or pretty. You have value to God because you are. You just are. You have value. When Boaz looked at Ruth, he said, I want her. I want her. In verse 9 and 10, it's interesting, he says, Then Boaz announced to the elders, Today, you are my witnesses, I have bought from Naomi all the property, and then, as well as Ruth. He paid whatever was required. The Bible never says how much he had to pay. Doesn't insinuate anything, doesn't suggest anything, just he paid everything that was necessary. Ladies, wouldn't that be nice if your husbands would say, Whatever it costs, honey, I'm going to take care of you. Isn't that what a loving person does? Pays any price? <coughs> Willing to pay any price for you? Willing to do anything for you? Boaz ransomed Ruth. In a sense, Ruth and Naomi were destitute without any hope. You and I, we were without hope. Now, I know the world out here thinks it has all kinds of hope. Some people out in the world believe that, w the, that this life we live, 70 years and 80 maybe, maybe 90, and then we die, and then that's the end. Some people believe this is all we have. It's interesting that every known group of people throughout history have had some concept of an afterlife. Everybody does, except some really smart people who think they know better. There are some people in our world today, in this country, who don't really believe that they have to do anything about their sin, their situation. That they can somehow work themselves out. Somehow they can just work and take care of themselves. And somehow they can just do what's needed to get along. Naomi and Ruth had nothing they could do about their situation. Not one thing except slavery the rest of their lives. And guaranteed slavery. You think, oh, well, it couldn't have been that bad. Listen, ladies, you have no idea what Christianity has done for you in setting you free. In setting you free to go and work and to accomplish and to, to gain wealth for your own life and for your family. You know, when a man, uh, for some reason, is out of the picture, he's dead or whatever, and, and just gone, you ladies can get jobs. You can make a living. But not Naomi and not Ruth. It was not going to happen ever for them. They would be destitute all of their lives. When you and I look at our own hearts 
and we see our own sin, only then will you say, ooh, I am destitute. I am in deep trouble. Deep, deep trouble. I think about Jesus, that he ransomed us from the enemy. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. You've got to get your Bibles out. You're going to turn some verses here. 1 Peter chapter 1. Verses 18 to 20. In fact, while I'm talking, you can look ahead and see the verse. And turn to the next verse. Okay? 1 Peter chapter 1. Verses 18 through 20. Knowing that you were not redeemed. You were not purchased. You were not ransomed. You were not redeemed with perishable things. Like silver and gold from your futile life, way of life, inherited from your forefathers. You were not redeemed because somebody bought you with silver and gold. Some people think they give enough to God, somehow that's going to take care of it. Some people think they can do lots of things that take care of their sin. But you were not redeemed by those kinds of things. Verse 19 says, But you were redeemed with the precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ, for he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for your sake. Redeemed by the blood of Christ, he was foreknown. This was done before you were even born. Before the foundation of the world, Jesus was going to die. Why? To redeem you. To buy you. And at the very beginning, I said, you have great value to God. Not for your intellect, not for your understandings, not for your abilities. You are valuable to God because you are you, you are here. You are alive and he considers you valuable. So you say, well, how valuable are you? This week was our 44th anniversary. I said, Mary Jo, let's go out to dinner. I'll take you wherever you want to go. Where did we end up, Mary Jo? Yeah, we're not probably going to go there again. I wasn't too thrilled. It was okay. But you know what? We just wanted to be together. It didn't matter where we went. Obviously. It just didn't matter. We just wanted to be together. You know, and yet... You think, but I'm willing to take you to a really nice place if you want to throw away some money. I'll do that if you want. You want to do that, honey? Well, I already know Mary Jo will say no to that. Because she does not want to do that. But you know what? All these 44 years, we've tried to take care of each other. She takes care of me, I take care of her. We love each other. And I look at this, what Jesus has done. How valuable is Mary Jo to me? I would do anything for her. But Jesus, Jesus, he died. He died. Matthew 20, 28 says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. They didn't kill Jesus. He let them. They didn't overpower Jesus. He allowed it to happen. He gave his life. He wasn't commanded to do it by people. He wasn't given something so he could do it. He said, I will give my life for you. You have value to God. Now stop listening to the world. Stop listening to their idea of value. Stop listening to all that stuff. God has said, you have value. And if you had been the only one who sinned, Jesus would have died for you. Just you. If the rest of us were all perfect and you were the only sinner, Jesus would have died for you. That's how much he cares for you. Don't you ever think that it's all about other people. You have great value. Your worth is based in who he is. Any other worth you try to gain in this world will fall short of giving you what you need. You won't have value until you settle inside that you have worth to God. And since he, the creator of everything, considers you valuable, are you valuable? I just got a letter this week that found out my house is of greater value. You know why I found that out? Because they're going to tax me more now. The county just decided we can't pass a levy to charge you anymore, so we're just going to raise what your house is worth. Right? How many of you got that letter? Did you get? Yeah, there you go. Didn't you know that? Yeah, isn't that exciting? You don't have to raise the levy, just raise the valuation of your house. I found out my house is worth that much. I can't get that much for my house. 
You know, and so what is that? What is the value? How, how do you value something? By what someone's worth wanting to pay for it. What's, what's somebody worth willing to pay for my house? Well, it isn't what these guys say. I kind of know the market. It isn't. It won't get that. So you look at yourself. What are you worth? What's your blood worth? What's your hair worth? Count it all up. It's not much. You are worth what somebody is willing to pay for you. The blood of Jesus. Nowhere else are you going to find a God who sends his son to die for his children. Nowhere. Nobody. No matter what philosophy they follow, no matter what gods they follow, they will never find anyone who will pay that kind of price, who values people. We as, uh, as Christians, we value life because God created life and God values your life. That's why we stand against abortion. That's why we stand against uh, murder. That's why we stand against anyone who would kill. Why do we stand? Because God created us and values every life. It sickens my heart the number of abortions we continue to have in this country. I hate it. Because God values those little babies. He values them. Jeremiah said, you knew me while I was still in my mother's womb. You knew me. Value. You have value before God. Psalm 34, 22 says, The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Hmm. Value keeps us. What's required to purchase us? Romans 6.23. Who knows Romans 6.23? Say it. Yeah, the wages of sin is death. You know, why do we need to be redeemed? Because we're going to die. Why does God have to send uh, someone to die for sin? Because he required it. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission for sin. No forgiveness for sin. That's what Hebrews says. No forgiveness for sin. No remission for sin. Why? Because God has required death for sin. You say, well, I'm not as bad as some people in the world. No, you're not as bad as some, and I'm not as bad as some, and I'm better than some, and I'm not, you know, not as good as some, and you know, kind of in there in the middle someplace. And you, know, you sit there and you think, well, I'm not all that bad. Listen, the wages of one sin is death. You can be the most perfect person in the world, but one sin will send you to hell. Just one. Just one. One. It's interesting, as Paul says, if you've broken the law in one point, you've broken the entire law. Why? Because the law is summed up in thou shalt be perfect. And we are not. So here we stand, sinners and judged for our sin. But God, I'm a good person. That's fine, but you're a sinner. I mean, work hard at being good. But until the Redeemer purchases you, you are still like Naomi and Ruth, destitute. No matter how hard you work, you are going to be without forgiveness for your sin. You're going to be stuck, dead in your trespasses and sins, is the way Paul, Paul talked about it. You're there. And you look at this and you say, oh my goodness, death is required, but Jesus has died for me. Jesus has redeemed you. He has purchased you. Isn't that exciting? He looked down and he said, I want you. He went in to the uh, he went into the, the shop and he looked around and he saw you, Kyle. He said, I want you. I know you grew up in a Christian home. I know you said prayers. But I want you. Right? He took you off the shelf and he paid the price. He laid down the cost, his blood, and he purchased you. And he purchased you and he purchased you and he purchased you and he purchased you. You and I are all purchased by Jesus. 
if you have surrendered to him. Otherwise, you're still on the shelf and you're not in his kingdom. See, he comes to us and he says, I want you. You respond to him in faith. I say, all right, God, here is my life. I give it to you. I surrender to you. I submit to you. I realize that without your forgiveness, I will always be a reprobate. I will always be without any hope. And I'll spend eternity separated from you because the wages of sin is death. But until you turn to him, there's no forgiveness. There's no redemption. He chooses us. Pulls us off. And says, you're mine. You're mine. And I thought about this. And I thought, what does that say to you and to me as Christians? So I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Say, what does it really mean then if I'm purchased by Christ and his blood has taken and washed away my sin, that his death was for me and that I belong to him, what does that mean for me? 1 Corinthians 6, chapter 6, verse 15 through 20. Do you not know? This is interesting, isn't it? Hey, psst, hadn't you got it yet? Don't you know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says, the two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body. But the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? You are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. There's the therefore. You've been bought with a price. Purchased by the blood of Jesus. Now, glorify God in your body. Cut out the sin. Cut out the attitude. Cut out the complaining. Cut out the griping. Cut out the sin. Cut out the immorality. Cut out the bad thoughts. Stop watching things you shouldn't watch. Stop saying things you shouldn't say. Stop lacking in your trust for Him and in Him. Glorify God in your body. God, may you be glorified in my body today. God, you be honored in me, at my work. Lord, may people see Jesus in me. Thomas said he had a big meeting in his office this last week. And he said, up on his board is his memory verse. How big is the whiteboard there, Thomas? Yeah, five by three. And he writes up there, Proverbs 3. What? what four, what? Proverbs 3, 5. Yeah, 3, 5, and 6. Yeah. Ah, there you go. Trust in the Lord at the very beginning. You are not going anywhere in your life until you learn to trust in the Lord. To depend on Him. So he puts it up on the board. In walks the boss, and walks this other boss, this other guy. They all look. Guess what they read? You think they saw the verse up there? Yeah. They made comments too. But you're never going to have an effect and glorify God in your body until you put yourself on the line and say, it's more about God than it is me. What if his boss came in there and said, uh, we don't want any of that in our company? What, would, what should Thomas do? Find another company. Because God is first. And you bring glory to him. There are things you're doing in your life. Do not bring glory to God. Stop it. Stop it. Say, that's easier said than done. Well, then get some help. Get some help. Let God show you that he can be all you need. Live wisely. You have been purchased. You are not your own. Paul called him a slave of God. A slave of Christ. A slave. He, listen, Paul knows the language. He used the word slave for a reason. We are not our own. We've been purchased. We have great value. The second thing. We're almost done. That's a lot to talk. 
we have a new relationship. It's interesting that he purchases Ruth, right? And then he marries her. He takes her to be his wife. He marries her. Gave him his name. He took on responsibility for her. He said, you will be under me now. I will give you everything you need. You are my wife. And for the rest of her life, Boaz took care of her. And Naomi. And their children. You and I, we are Christ's bride. Listen. Listen to Revelation chapter 19. I'll read it to you. Revelation 19. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has been made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are true words of God. You are Christ's bride. Your clothes will be your righteous acts. You're his bride. I remember, you know, I put a picture up of, on, on Facebook of Mary John and me and, and our wedding, you know. <clears throat> there were a lot of comments about how young we looked. Some about how skinny we were. Yes, both were true. We were 21 years old and stupid. Really just dumb. <clears throat> Had no idea what we were going to do. Still a senior year in college. God took care of lots of things for us. But I, I, I remember looking at that couple this last week and thought, oh my goodness. I loved her so much. I couldn't imagine living without her. Now, 44 years later, I had no idea how much you could love someone and care for someone and how their, their, um, their joy and their um, how much her joy and her um, well-being was important to me. So you go out of your way to love the, your wife. And I thought, and that's a human's love for his wife. Doesn't even come close to how much God loves you and me. Not even close. Not even close. And if we can love someone deeply, and care for them unselfishly. How much more does our Heavenly Father love us? Jesus is our bridegroom. We are his children. Ephesians 5 says, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ has loved the church. Guys, we're supposed to love our wives like Christ loves the church. Well, how does he love the church? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? Obviously, he was willing to die. He's committed himself to us. Philippians 1.6 says, For I'm confident of this very thing, that he has begun a good work in you, will perform it. He'll perfect it. He'll make it right. He doesn't quit. God does not give up on you. We talked about Haley a little earlier. God does not give up on his children. He does not give up on them, and you shouldn't give up on anyone either. We have an ongoing battle in our home over giving up on people. I refuse to give up on people. Mary Jo does quicker than I. She thinks I'm crazy. <laughs> you know, and I just refuse. Why? Because God refuses to give up on us. We're his bride. He's going to do everything he can to make his bride worthy when they come to see him at the marriage supper. He's going to do everything possible. He's committed himself to us. He loves us. He's given us the Holy Spirit as a pledge in Ephesians chapter 1. He says that Holy Spirit is the pledge. We give a ring. I gave Mary Jo a ring. We went together to buy the ring. I turned in an insurance policy. Got enough money to buy a ring. Bought a ring. We went and bought that thing together. Spent every dime we had in that ring. She still wears that ring. I bought her another ring later, much later. 
So she wears both rings. Because you know what? That first one was a special one. Real special. It isn't very big. Lord knows we didn't have much to get to buy it. It's not very big. But it was my pledge of my love to her. I love you. I can't show a lot in this little ring, but it's a pledge. And that's why I wear the ring today. That's why she still wears a ring today. Why? Because it's a pledge of more. A pledge of more. And God has given you the Holy Spirit as a pledge of more to come. More to come. There's an inheritance in heaven stored up for you beyond description. How do you even express it? Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. You can't come. But I'm going to prepare a place for you. He's getting a house for us. The groom is getting a house for his bride. He's taking care of you. He's committed to you. He's pledged you. He's getting a, a place for you. Colossians 3, 4 says, When Christ who is our life is revealed, then you also will be revealed in, in glory. He is our life. And the reason we struggle so much is He is not your life. This world is your life. But He is your life. He is your power. He's your wisdom. He's your love, your peace, your joy, your patience, your satisfaction. He is everything to you. Or you're going to find trouble in this world. See, people without Jesus don't know what it feels like to be perfectly content with less, more, doesn't matter. For a Christian to say, you know what, if I don't have a lot, I'm fine. You go on the mission field and you see people everywhere who love Jesus with all of their hearts and have very, very little. And they're happy. And we can't get a big enough car, a big enough house, enough money in the bank. Christians, you need to be happy with your bride, groom. You need to be happy about the groom. He's made a pledge. He deposited the Holy Spirit in you and said to you, I have great things in store for you. Great things if you'll just follow and obey. If you'll just serve me. I have great things for this life and for the next. On to eternity. He's pledged himself to you. Is that not enough? And I thought, Lord, how do we wrap this up? If the first one is... It, if the first one is that we are to live wisely, what about this? And I had just one word. Relax. Relax. Enjoy the groom. You're on a date with Jesus. Some of you are like the guy who is with his date and he keeps looking over at someone else. You know what that does to the other person? Makes them want to... <laughs> Maybe you need to see your life as dating him. And quit looking at all the others. But just to him. Colossians, listen to Colossians chapter 1. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the Christ, Christ, the church. And he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. And through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven, this is your room. Relax. Enjoy your walk with him. Follow him. Let him lead you. Trust in him. Delight yourself in Him, and He'll give you the desires of your heart. Focus your whole life on Him. Your alternative is to focus on yourself. And you 
will not live well. You focus on him. Relax. He's got it under control. Trust him. Depend on him. Mary Jo, come and let's do this song.